Hi, I'm Laura Nathanson. I'm a principal in the San Francisco office, and I'm here to tell you that you too can be a business architect. Now, I am a business architect, but I call myself the accidental architect because while I'm very happy with where I ended up, I didn't start my journey with architect as the destination. In fact, I have spent most of my adult life as an opera singer with IT consulting as a backup. I only became a full-time consultant in 2011 after fully transitioning away from my musical career. After we've walked through my unusual journey together, I think you'll agree that if someone like me can become a business architect at Pariveda, you can too. So why business architecture? Why am I happy as a business architect when I didn't start out to be one? I think it has to do with my personal mission statement and how I see the purpose of business architecture. I believe business architecture is about helping organizations become excellent by optimizing people, processes, and structure. My personal mission statement is to be an excellent person, which relates to people, working with excellent people, which relates to process, in an excellent organization, which relates to structure. So as you can see, business architecture fits me like the proverbial glove. Now, why business architecture at Pari Veda? Every day, our clients and prospects are facing digital disruption, the change that is constantly occurring due to technology innovation such as AI, ML, cloud infrastructure, and IoT. Pari Veda is committed to helping our clients navigate this ever-changing landscape. And in order to be competitive and help our clients holistically, we can't just focus on IT. We need to see the whole enterprise, and business architecture is an important component of that enterprise view. That's why we are doing more and more projects that include business architecture across Pariveda. Let's set some context for what it means to be an architect at Pariveda. Now, according to our expectations framework, there is no difference between the behaviors of a business, product, or technical architect. All architects are expected to demonstrate problem solving, frameworks and models, and thought leadership. Let's dive into these a bit more deeply. So problem solving. The components of problem solving are problem diagnosis, which means being able to accurately diagnose the problem, analytical thinking, which is a critical part of problem diagnosis, problem solving, and solutioning, and solutions, being able to create solutions to increasingly more complex problems. There's also frameworks and models. Now, there are quite a few expected behaviors here because Pariveda loves a good framework. So the first behavior is using frameworks, showing that you are using structured thinking as architects must. Systems thinking, being able to zoom out and understand the full system in which you're operating. System components, being able to identify and place the components of the system. Feedback loops, building in feedback, and check-ins to any system that you create, and design principles, using accepted design principles in your solutions, such as separation of concerns, cohesion, and coupling. There are non-technical design principles as well. One example is a user-centered web design principle. In your application, make sure people can do what they need to do in three clicks or less, hopefully less. And finally, we have thought leadership. So this contains points of view, which is being able to formulate and share points of view with the appropriate audiences as needed, and elegant solutions, pulling all of the architect skills together to create win-win solutions for all stakeholders. So right about now, you're probably wondering what in my unusual background helped me to develop these skills. Honestly, it was a combination of Star Trek, Socrates, music, and SharePoint. So let me talk through these four important influences. One of my early loves was Star Trek, and of course, the original version. Now, I did like Jim Kirk. He seemed heroic, but I thought he was a bit too impulsive. Plus, I was puzzled at how often he seemed to rip his shirt. Can't he pay more attention to his clothes, I wondered? You have to remember I was about 10 years old. 
But I did love Spock, and I loved how he was so consistently analytical and logical, and he seemed to always base his assumptions on facts and data, which seemed to give him the best type of solution. In fact, as a child, I so identified with Spock that I taught myself how to raise my left eyebrow just like him, and I was often seen walking around the house going, highly illogical. Now, Socrates, what does Socrates have to do with this? Well, my parents frequently use the Socratic method to help me frame my thoughts and arguments correctly. They used it as a teaching tool. When I made a statement of belief, they made sure that I thought of all the ways that that belief could be challenged. The Socratic method tests hypotheses via the use of probing questions, like in the example on the slide. Although at first in the example, the speaker says that they believe the gods know everything, it takes just a few questions from Socrates to disprove that statement. In case you're thinking this method has no relevance to today's world, you should probably be aware that it is used in law schools to train lawyers how to argue their cases effectively. And of course, music as an opera singer. Um, my early passion was music, and in combination with acting, I went to graduate school for opera and followed that passion for many years. Now, you may be looking at me and looking at this picture of famous opera singer Anna Moffo and wondering where are the hat horns and long golden braids. It surprised me to find out from my first opera singer teacher that not all opera involves screaming in German at the top of your lungs. In fact, there is a lot of incredible opera in Italian, French, and even English that is there for the singing. Once I realized that I did not have to be big blonde in German to sing opera, I opened my mind to discover amazing operatic actresses like Anna Moffo, who inspired me for many years. And finally, SharePoint. As this unique person who was pursuing an operatic career, I was also someone who loved IT, starting with my first home computer, an Acer dual floppy with a dot matrix printer hookup, and you know you're jealous. I began IT consulting in 1999, and throughout my career, I was fortunate enough to touch on a lot of different areas of IT, help desk, software training, project management and business analysis, and web design and development, to name a few. The turning point for me was when I discovered SharePoint in 2006. Now, at the time, it was just a glorified online file share with a web front end, but I really recognized the potential for collaboration, and I'm so happy that it's evolved into the basis for OneDrive and Teams. OK, so now you know all about me, but, but so what? What do Star Trek, Socrates, music, and SharePoint have to do with getting good at problem solving, frameworks and models, and thought leadership? And what about the business part? Well, let's talk about problem solving. So the components of problem solving are problem diagnosis, analytical thinking, and solutions. So for problem diagnosis, what helped me was Socrates. Now, Socrates helps me question my root cause assumptions, back up my assertions with facts, and seek to understand, perhaps most importantly. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about a real-life example in which I used problem diagnosis, and thank you, Socrates, for that. So I was leading a business architecture project where our mission was to optimize a core process in the legal department. After a few days of interviews and discussions with stakeholders, I realized that the process was very different than what we had assumed. Instead of being a process unto itself, it was a small part of a much larger process that crossed the entire enterprise. I discussed my findings with the executive sponsor, and we made the decision together to address parts, but not all, of the larger process. Had I not questioned where the process began and who was involved in every aspect of it, our team would not have made that discovery, and our solution would not have been as comprehensive and appreciated by our client. This was a good example of an unknown, unmet problem, which the Socratic method helped our team discover. Then there's analytical thinking and solutions. You probably were aware that I was going to go with Star Trek here. Uh, with Spock, I learned the value of logic to analyze problems and create sustainable solutions. Now let's go to frameworks and models. Components of frameworks and models are using frameworks and feedback loops, 
systems thinking, system components, and design principles. So for using frameworks and feedback loops, I'm going to go with Socrates again. I consider the Socratic method my first framework. Aww. So Socrates actually teaches you to structure your questions properly. You get your feedback in real time, so feedback loops. And you get that exit row yes before you move on. Now, the exit row yes is a technique that I use when I'm sitting in a room with stakeholders and discussing a solution. I make sure that every single stakeholder says, yes, I understand and I agree, before they leave the room. If they're still asking questions, my job is not done. And then there is frameworks and models. Systems thinking, system components, and design principles. There I'm going to go with SharePoint. SharePoint was a great help for me here. Because as a platform, SharePoint impacts all aspects of the organization. And it also includes best practices for designing content governance, site structure, and access control. I'm going to use another real world example here. So when you're rolling out a platform that is meant to be used by an entire enterprise, possibly encompassing tens of thousands of users, you've got to take every aspect of the implementation into account. When I worked on a small team that was building out both internal and external web portals for a large retail client's expansion into Canada, I expanded my thinking from just the look and feel of the portals and how they would function to the infrastructure required, the access and permissioning, the governance of how content would be published, including who would be allowed to do it and how, the security model, and many other aspects of the solution. That was the project in which I started out as a business analyst, but due to the time crunch and the small size of our team, ended up serving in several different roles, including as a developing solution architect. Now let's talk about thought leadership. Thought leadership contains elegant solutions and points of view. For elegant solutions, I am again going to lean on SharePoint because when you are rolling out an enterprise solution, you have so many stakeholders that you have to satisfy. Uh, each stakeholder has to feel that solution is a win-win for them. And then for points of view, I am going to finally bring in music. You knew it was coming sometime. So music does give you the confidence to stand up and present your opinion. And it also helps you project, which is also important. I'm going to use another real world example here. So when I'm planning and executing on a business architecture project, I typically build in something called the executive readout. That's when the team and I stand in front of our executive sponsors and present our findings, conclusions, and recommendations for optimizing people, process, and structure. I have had these go well, and I've had them go poorly. It's usually because when a strategy a consultant is hired to do business architecture, they have complex and difficult problems they have to solve. Our research and analysis often leads us to surprising conclusions that our executive sponsors may not want to hear. Luckily for me, my opera singing has given me the courage to stand up and deliver the point of view that we've come up with, and to persuade and defend when it doesn't go well. Now, I've talked a lot about architecture in general, but not as much about business architecture. So I wanted to share the Parivata view of how the different architectural domains interrelate. So we have business, product, and technology architecture here. Now, from my perspective, I'm a business and a technology architect, and I'm growing as a product architect. And you can do that too, but that's a different talk. As you look at these domains and where they're focused, think about yourself and where you might grow. Now let's bring it all together. Let's talk about how all these wonderful architectural skills can be used on a business architecture project. I'll give you a bit of context on my first project at Pariveda. I was literally staffed on my second day, staffed on day two, and explain how I was able to leverage my architectural know-how as a business architect. The job was to optimize a core business process for a dental insurance client. And our team was tasked with understanding the pain points of the exam's process from all perspectives, documenting our findings in a current state analysis, and co-creating a solution for an optimized future state. 
All of these three core capabilities of problem solving, frameworks and models, and thought leadership were instrumental in our team providing the company with a comprehensive set of recommendations and detailed deliverables that thoroughly outlined our point of view as to how to optimize the exams process. Problem solving helped me analyze the feedback we received from the interviews and workshops to ensure we were addressing all of the pain points and the future state aspirations the teams had shared. Frameworks and models such as Agile helped me ensure that we designed flexible processes with feedback loops included, and as well as continuous improvement touch points. Thought leadership allowed me to have the confidence to present findings that recommended deep changes to the organization and to the accountabilities and responsibilities expected of each participant in the process. Our stakeholders at the client were very pleased and implemented many of the recommendations immediately. And now for the final, most important slide, what does this have to do with me? And by me, I mean you. Well, because you work at Pariveda, whether you are intending to be a business architect or not, it is very likely that you are preparing to be one. And this is because if you've ever had a CDP in the architecture space, those skills are being built through the expectations framework that can then be expanded to be used in any of the architecture domains. And unlike my journey, yours is porpoiseful. And that's a good thing, because being a business architect is very important as a progression towards enterprise architecture at Pariveda. And our clients need us to provide that more holistic perspective on their problems, especially the unknown, unmet ones. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today. I hope you found this presentation interesting, educational, and fun. And since I'm still an opera singer, I'm going to literally end it on a high note. Happy FinFest, all. 